Happy Friday, everybody. Welcome to another privacy chat. And as uh, many of you know, uh, whenever we can, when there's an exciting new book out, we turn our privacy chat into the Privacy Book Club. Uh, privacy Book Club has been running for a number of years. It was started, oh, five, six years ago by a bunch of us geeks here in DC who uh, all had, I think, the same problem. And some of you probably have this problem too. There's so much coming out that you should read. As a person who wants to be, if you're junior, sort of learning, uh, if you're senior, broadening how sophisticated you are about broader issues in the world, tech policy issues, geostrategic issues, the latest data protection books, um, there's just this vast amount of stuff. There's science fiction books you better be reading. Um, and so my bedside is piled up. And actually at the bedside, I actually never read in bed, but you know, everywhere in my house is piled up with books that I order. And then I, I just don't get to read them because we're all busy. Um, and so like many, uh, we started a book club for those of us who kind of, you know, needed an excuse um, to network and to be social and to have an opportunity to, oh, I better read the book. My book club is coming up. And so it ran a couple of years in person. Um, and then um, the authors were often interested in joining and some of them could join us in person, but others were virtual. So we started having them call in um, and this was way before COVID, uh, and it really took off and we opened it up. So if you would like to, please um, go to the website and you can subscribe to the Privacy Book Club. And every time we have a great author lined up, we will email you. So before I turn to the great author I have today, let me just vent about what's bothering me uh, this week in the uh, big land of, uh, of privacy. And feel free to chime in with your own thoughts. We're watching the comments and we will um, uh, bring them in if uh, if we can. So, you know, a couple of, I guess it was a week or two ago, um, there was a big focus on Zoom's um, privacy policy and terms. And, and it wasn't anything they actually recently said or did or updated. It was someone reading some language that was there uh, a while ago. And there was a big flap about uh, how are they using um, uh, uh, data for AI. And I looked at it and I'm like, I think I know a lot of other companies that are doing exactly what Zoom sort of spelled out here. And I think the critics are maybe over reading um, what they think is happening here. But you know what? You got to assume that when people look at your policy today, if you're a flashy brand or you're a big company or you're doing something new um, and you maybe know what you do and you write it legally and carefully, today you got to put on your kind of tinfoil hat and you need to say there are people skeptical of me I'm a big company I'm a tech company I'm doing some new thing with data I'm using the words AI they're going to be people scrutinizing and saying I don't know I think that might mean all these scary things and so you know you deserve the criticism because this is the way it is and you need to know and so you do need to add that word you do need to promise that you're not, you know, beating up this. You're not, you're not doing things that you don't do because people are going to read it. And frankly, if it isn't clear, they're certainly going to go there. So, um, you know, that was clear. Um, but this week, um, our friends at the, the Mozilla Foundation, they have sort of an advocacy, you know, wing that's trying to advance uh, uh, awareness of privacy. And so they did a report about the auto industry. And again, I looked at it and it says, all cars sell your data. And I'm like, actually, I know that almost every auto company who's signed on to the automotive principles swears they don't. So they'd all be gone to privacy jail if they did. But you know what? Their, pro their website policies probably have ad tech. And so given the requirements of the way uh, uh, state laws are, are being drafted, many companies now say, thank you to the California friends, say they sell data, even though they don't sell all your personal data, but they do ad tech and certainly what's happening at your website. Now, okay, again, the companies, it's on them. Do understand that people are going to read and misread and read it broadly. Yeah, gotta, you know, really be clear about it. But on the other hand, if you're an expert critic and you really want to advance the conversation, it behooves you to do more than say, I will take the most, you know, broad and possibly potentially theoretically, you know, um, permissive uh, idea 
uh, even though anybody you talk to in privacy would tell you, no, nah, that's not really what's going on there. So uh, fault on both sides. But anyway, that's what I'm venting about um, this week. It would be more useful if the critics actually did criticism that privacy leaders could take back to the company and say, hey, look, we're being criticized here. We, we, we can't do that. We shouldn't do that, right? As opposed to that's not what we said, and they're just out to get us, right? Or that the FTC could use it and say, hey, but here the FTC is going to have to look at it and be like, um, actually, we can't prosecute based on this because most of it is overheated, you know, rhetoric. Okay, I got it off my chest. No more privacy talk. Let's talk networking. Why should a show, uh, a conversation like the privacy chats I have or the book club chats, uh, which are often about privacy books or tech policy books, networking, that's an anti-privacy thing, right? That's like privacy people where we're introverts. I'm not, but <laughs> lots of introverts who kind of, you know, are are drawn to the whole notion of privacy because they don't want to let it all hang out there and be poking people and prodding them and, and looking for personal information and so forth, right? No, not true, right? Lots of us in this community um, are here because we are empathetic and we care about people and we care about respecting information, but we also care about sharing information in ways that build relationship that are respectful, right? We're not typically the people who want to live on a rock and think the black helicopters are coming and, and really want, you know, deep privacy. We want respectful use of our data in a way that empowers us and respects human rights, right? That's what data protection is, uh, is supposed to do. Maybe sometimes I really want privacy and I want to be alone, but most of us want to be able to connect and share without worrying that the information is going to be abused, misused, and so on and so forth. So I'm delighted to have with me the author of a brand new book. Here it is, Rachel Simon. Um, this book, Rachel tells me, comes out Tuesday. So if you're excited by what we talk about today, go order it now. Um, but let's bring Rachel in. Rachel is a longtime senior executive at uh, at AT and T. Um, how many years? Have you, I know you've got a long. You started out. 29, 29 years. How many years has the privacy function been part of your portfolio? Yeah, so I have been in the privacy space for about three years now. Um, I've been with AT&T for 29 years through all of its evolutions from when it started as Southwestern Bell and of course grew into AT&T. And most of my career was on the customer care side and on the finance side. And when I was asked to get involved in a little project called CCPA, um, I just fell in love with privacy. And I think it's interesting because I have such a deep care for the customer. And I also have a deep concern about protecting data and enabling the business and everything else. And so it just merged all of my passions. And I can't think of a better place to be right now than in privacy. So let me ask you this. For a good part of your career, you were working different aspects of the business and the networking. Um, I'll, I'll let you give us a bit of a background of sort of how that became a, a personal strategy and then something where you actually were, were teaching it and, and speaking about it and, and so on and so forth. But I, I want to jump right into something interesting first, though. What's Have you seen a difference from your general corporate experience uh, where maybe people in, in sales know, hey, you got a network to get ahead or you know, uh, or, or in a big business organization, uh, everyone gets, uh, oh, I, I got to have a relationship with, with the higher ups to get ahead. And the privacy world, although, you know, even at a, a big organization often ends up being sort of a, a bit of a bubble, right? Of people who kind of, you know, get it. And uh, it's a small community. Um, do, you, do you see any difference now that you're interacting with uh, IAPP conferences and with, you know, broader peers at, at privacy. Are, are we more stunted in our ability to network uh, because of our background or do we, do we, it feels to me, we've got a bit to learn. Um, there do seem to be lots of folks who I think get it and get that it's important, but do seem to feel a little bit more, you know, awkward, um, uh, is that, uh, am I, uh, any difference in, in recent years for you in terms of this community? Well, here, here's the thing. First of all, I feel like you are the master of networking, Jules. You could have written this book yourself. You are the mayor of the privacy world. And it's because you focus on relationships. And so when people hear the word networking, I think they get cold and clammy. It's like, I don't know. I don't know how to network. I don't know how to play golf. I don't know how to go to happy hours and give out business cards and find people on LinkedIn. That's not networking. Networking is about building relationships. 
And really at its core, when done properly, networking makes people feel good. It's when you remember something about them. It's when you find something that could be helpful. And so when I think about my own evolution with networking, I tried all the stuff that I just mentioned. I first tried golf when I first joined the company 29 years ago. I failed an extracurricular class. Don't ask me how I failed, but they said, please take this again. And I failed that one too. It's never stepped foot on a golf course again. And then when I realized that I connect really well with people one-on-one, -on -one, that's how I built my network. It's, hey, let's go to lunch. Hey, let's go to coffee. Hey, let's have a virtual coffee. And so once you put it in context of relationships, it changes the game. And so when you ask about the privacy profession, we can't do anything in a vacuum uh, at a big company like AT&T, but even a small company, there are so many different de departments, different business units that privacy touches. Of course, there's chief data office and chief security office and marketing and customer care and everything. And if you don't have those relationships, if you can't sit down over a cup of coffee and say, here are our priorities, where are your priorities? Let's make sure that they all match up. It's very difficult to get things done. Yeah. You know, and even beyond the company, there's so many new areas that are so gray where we're still trying to understand what's really the best practice. W what is health data right now? Non HIPAA health data. Exactly. We have all these new laws that say it needs higher protections. Right. What does it include? What does it exclude? How broad? And understanding what peers are doing and colleagues are doing throughout the industry and what they're thinking is ends up being so critical, right? You, you're a privacy professional. And you say, well, here's this new law. And it might mean we should shut down, well, this entire business, or actually maybe the way we all think it's going to be interpreted means that it's going to be okay to do these things and those things. And you kind of want to know what is everyone else doing or what are they thinking or what are the evolving practices that policymakers and privacy experts and civil society and academics are thinking about. And some are people are out there writing it, but there's a lot that, that don't. And if you don't have those relationships, it's super hard um, to, I think, think through and advise your business and have that judgment to say, this is kind of the right thing to do here, given the counter, you know, countervailing uh, challenges. Let's That's take exactly right. Yeah. Let's, let's take the international data flows, right? Yeah. It's, it was theoretically illegal to transfer data from Europe for the last, you know, whatever time that the uh, privacy shield number 12 was, was down, right? But... And in theory, you could get billion dollar fine like like Meta did, but most companies didn't freeze their data flows and say, well, well the court said that and the EDPB said that and the NSA could be there. So let's stop. Most people said, ah, oh, well, there'll be a new shield and and, and we're going to do our best with having contracts and best practices. And technically, I can tell you that it's not without risk. And yes, there might be some enforcements against cookies and tracking and big tech, but most of us are not gonna cut off our European customers. Mm -hmm. And we know our colleagues are all of like mind. All right, let me ask you this. The, you, you talked right away about it being about relationships. I, I do feel that when you tell people, young people who are coming out of school and trying to build a network, that, uh, or even others who are looking for a job, they feel like it's inauthentic. You know, they feel like you should socialize in a natural way with the people you want to socialize with. And that when you do these artificial things, they feel needy or pushy or inappropriate or, or intrusive. Um, and I, I guess if you do it in an inauthentic way, it can be right. But right. What's your reaction to this? It's not authentic. To, I don't feel right doing that. That's not me. Well, and so, of course, I'm going to answer it by you be you. And so, you know, you're the best you and I'm, I'm the best me. So don't um, take any of my experience and substitute it for your own if it's not who you are. But what I have found is when I reverse the question and when I think, how would I feel getting this? It changes the whole equation. And so it can be scary to reach out to someone and say, hey, I saw you speak on that panel and what you said resonated with me. Can we get a cup of coffee one day? That's scary to put yourself out there. But then when I put it in reverse and I think, how would I get, get feel getting that message? Oh, wow. What I said resonated with you? Yes, I would love to talk about that. If you look at my email inbox right now, it's, you know, problem, problem, problem. Oh, a compliment, <laughs> right? You know, we're all human. We're all human. We all like uh, to know that we touch people. And so when done the right way and when done authentically, 
you know, one of the biggest tips that I have for people too is find ways to connect a past conversation with a future conversation. So, oh, we talked um, last time about work-life balance. I saw this article. I thought you might like it. Oh, um, when you spoke on that panel, you spoke about, you know, the um, the fines that are coming out of Europe. Um, I, I saw this this talk and I thought you might enjoy it. So it's finding ways to authentically bring in your past to have a better future as well. I think sometimes when people think networking, they're jumping to this very maybe transactional end goal, which is like, oh, I, I should start networking because I, I'm, I'm going to be looking for a job in a bit, right? And so to them, networking means, oh, reach out and ask people for a lead or for uh, to, to tell them about an opportunity or, uh, and of course that does feel, you know, inauthentic. Um, and look, there's a place for that. Yeah. But, I, you know, I think what you're telling us is, guess what? If you want to be in a position where those things come to you or when you do have yes. that sort of thing to ask, you've built the, um, what's the name of that famous sort of book, build your bed, be, you know, make your bed uh, before you need it or whatever. Yeah. Or dig your, dig your well before you're thirsty is the one I like. Yes. And I love that phrase because it's so true that you're building the foundation now for when you need it later. It's like having a rainy day fund because the one thing we know for certain one day it's going to rain. <laughs> and when you have those relationships to draw on. And, you know, you mentioned something um, a few minutes ago that I, I wanted to pull on the thread a little bit of um, there's a great quote that says mentoring is when one person's um, hindsight becomes another person's foresight. And it's the same thing in our whole industry here. So when we see the, some of the fines and some of the regulations that are coming out, it's almost a, a risk that we don't need to take to just look inward. We need to look outward as well. And when we can sit down at conferences and have these kind of conversations, attend panels and get all that information, it just helps our own programs in general and helps us to be better privacy professionals too. What struck me most as I was um, going through um, so many of the examples and, and for folks listening, um, you know, if this sort of all comes naturally to you maybe the lesson is um take the time right some of you maybe don't need some of the very specific advice rachel gives but the biggest takeaway i got was she makes the time and then you know what to say i mean if i said to you just carve out a half an hour every day where you were going to engage in social media instead of scrolling you know aimlessly um, where you engaged maybe and, and gave a kudos and gave a compliment or, or, or sent an email or um, thought about some of the people who you should interact with or should say something to. Uh, you know, as a manager, I find uh, where I'm often guilty uh, is um, because I think a lot of your, your advice and, and certainly some of your, your networking uh, focus has, has been what I would frankly say, hey, that's just good managing to make sure that you are providing a compliment, providing a, a personal right. connection, and re respecting, you know, uh, uh, the holidays and issues that others have. But I think we we get so busy because we have a job and we have a job and we have things to do. And then this sort of seems like the extracurricular stuff that just, it's not urgent. So then we end up not doing it. And the big message that, that I got was, you know what, you got to consider that part of like, just like you, you might have to schedule things with your friends because you, you, you're not going to see them in the normal course of That's time. Right. You're not in That's college right. anymore where your friends are hanging out and you just run into them. You, you build, you plan, Hey, I want to see these people this month. And then you, you know, you make it happen. You need to carve out that time and say, Hey, it's just my time to walk around the floor and say hello to people. It's my time to give some support to the people that are in my world. But how do you, you, you seem to really, you know, if, if all of these examples that you provide are really things that you do, and, and I, I know they are, how do you manage the time when there are emergencies and, and you're dealing yeah. with, you know, uh, your boss and your your subordinates and your peers and how do you protect the time? Do you do you chart it into your schedule? Or? I do. Well, and it's going to sound so counterintuitive, but it's actually a time saver to network. 
What do I mean by that? Because I have such a broad network, I can just pick up the phone. I can just, you know, walk over and talk to somebody when I run into an issue instead of having to go through, you know, calendars and assistance and, you know, reaching out coldly to somebody when I run into an issue. So again, it's that dig your well before you're thirsty kind of comment. So I go to lunch or coffee or have a virtual networking with someone just about every single day, just about every day. And I have to eat anyway. I may as well eat with other people. And uh, when people say, you know, what, what do you talk about when you go? Well, you know, it's probably 30% personal, 70% business. Of course, want to get to know them as a person and understand their family and vacation plans and, and everything else. But tell me what's going on in your, in your world. And then as you are listening to the answer, you're saying, oh, how does that connect to my world? And it's so amazing, some of the light bulbs that go off so often in these coffees and lunches, like, oh my gosh, I didn't even know you were working on that. Oh my goodness, I didn't even know I should be connecting with you. And so by having these kind of conversations proactively, it's a time saver on the other end when you're not in a fire drill. I have very few fire drills. I really, I mean, I, I, I don't know if I'm lucky or, or if I'm good, but I'll take the luck. But um, it's because a lot, of a lot of those relationships that people flag things for me that are coming up and I can lay the seeds for when before it becomes an issue. I'll tell you one of my secrets as a busy person who, who does like to socialize, but I, I can't easily as easily get out. And people say, oh, let's get together for a drink, right? And you know, by the time I get out of the office, you know, meet them and you know, it's like an hour and a half. So here, here's what I do. So you see that sign um, that's not there just to be a backdrop. I've got a bar behind it with <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. I'll, 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 I'll pull it out of the way here. Right. You do, you have a full bar behind there. Wow. Yeah, my, wow. And my scotch collection over there. Wow. And so when people say, Hey, let's get together. I say, Hey, come on by. And you know, after hours, I'll pour them a little drink, drinking a lot of wine now and not scotch. Cause I've been studying wine. So the scotch is, is actually going to waste. So stop by if anyone's interested, but it's, you know, and again, I'm a little more senior. I can say, hey, why don't you come to me and I have yeah. space. It's a, but I think there are ways where, you know, you're, you're doing it at the. Uh, well, first of all, I, I think that's awesome. That That is awesome. That's the first time I saw someone pull a screen and reveal a full bar. This would not work for me because I am famous for my poor taste in wine. That uh, the, the sweeter and cheaper, the better. I'm a Moscato lover. So this would not work for me. But But, <laughs> but I'm sure your folks love it. Well, I think the 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 lessons you provide um, about really um, carving the time are, yeah. are key. But I think there were, um, you know, another area that as I was reading in the book, I was sort of, you know, debating. Um, you really describe your strategy for holidays and holiday cards and so forth. And again, here's an area where I've always had um, sort of mixed feelings. Um, uh, on one hand, that's a lot of time to really do the holiday card thing. And I know when I get like a photo or something, I look at it, I show my spouse, oh, look at this, they went skiing or, you know, and so forth. Oh, look, their kids, they're so big. Oh, their dog's cute, right? And then I kind of like feel rude if I'm gonna throw it out because it's like a picture, but like, you know, it's not going on my mantle. Um, yeah. And so, you know, I do throw it out and I'm like, um, but, but the digital thing that never seems as fully certainly the mass thing and i think you you you're, you're certainly critical of the people who do sort of the mass right uh, happy holidays to all my friends so yes. I so talk a bit about how you've sort of managed um, the personalization you're, you are now doing it digitally but, but you have sort of a strategy for that I do. Yes. Yeah. So I, um, I get a holiday card with my family every year. And um, by the way, behind every smiling family is a parent threatening to take away electronics if the kids don't smile. Right. So we've all, we've all been there. Um, but I used to send out a huge stack of holiday cards to former supervisors, colleagues, you know, a great way to keep in touch. And then several years ago, I switched to scanning one in and sending it digitally. And to your point, Jules, I do it one at a time. I don't do a mass blind copy, so that way it's personalized. Jules, you know, happy holidays to you and your family. Uh, what, what are your plans? Here's what my kids are up to, et cetera. And people feel like they've seen my kids grow up by, by seeing these pictures. And so the reason I switched it, the, the main reason, first of all, they're expensive and also the environmental impact, like you mentioned, of just throwing it away. But the main reason is that two-way communication. 
So if I get a card in the mail, chances are very slim that then I'm gonna to turn to my computer and say, thank you so much for the card of your family. But if it's digital, I can easily respond back. And that's that two-way communication. And then usually after a time or two of going back and forth about your plans, hey, let's get coffee one day. I would love to, to catch up after the new year. So it's finding a way to again, pull in that personal connection. And how do you use social media to, to network? Where does that fit into your brain? I'm not great at it. Um, I am on LinkedIn. I've been on LinkedIn a lot recently because I'm promoting the book. Um, did we mention, by the way, that all of the profits go to United Way? And so Ooh. I would love to reach a broad audience. But um, I'm, I, I'm, I'm not so comfortable promoting myself. So, you know, I'm told I'm promoting the book, not myself. Um, so I don't post a ton on social media, but I do know people that use it very, very effectively. And especially, I think you mentioned this earlier on Jules about commenting. So not just hitting a like, but commenting something. So that way the person knows that you really saw it and it's a way to engage. You can also directly message someone too. if something that they posted really resonated with you. I, I'm surprised at how many people in the privacy community probably undermine, frankly, their bigger picture careers. Uh, on social media by kind of, you know, ranting and raving. And I get, you know, we can have different opinions and, and right. you can, I'm not arguing people shouldn't disagree or criticize, you know, things, but you know, when you howl at the moon or you just say things in a rude or, you know, aggressive way, and, and then they wonder why is no one inviting me to panels or like, right. or, or things they don't know where people right. didn't reach out because the person just seems so sort of hostile when, when in, practice if you had a conversation with them they'd probably explain to you their critique and and you know have a discussion and and you know and again i'm not arguing don't disagree but you know if you're gonna howl at the moon in the way some do attacking this company attacking yeah. this person you're really just cutting out you know a chunk of the future and again go ahead stand on principle but you can do it in a way you can the, the, the most interesting people are the ones who can really disagree and make their point and show you how they're right and you're wrong in a way that actually is respectful and maybe even convincing instead yes. of just, I'm putting you uh, down. Yes. Um, our friend Emily Barwell uh, says, uh, Rachel, what tips to give for networking as a youngish female? Sometimes asking somebody for drinks or coffee can be awkward, can be taken the wrong way. Other young women have, um, felt similar. Yeah, really important question. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks for asking, Emily. Um, so uh, can I promote the book? Uh, so the book, which comes out on Tuesday, All Profits Go to United Way. I have um, over 200 examples of verbiage of how to ask people about how to ask people for that coffee or that lunch. Um, I personally have never had an issue as a female. Um, I am an introvert by nature and I'm shy by nature, but I'm equally shy around women and men. So it's never been an issue for me of, oh, can I ask this man for a cup of coffee? Um, but for some people that could be um, unthinkable, right? Uh, cultural differences, et cetera. But I hope that um, I'll give you some ideas in the book about flipping the script. How would you feel? How would you feel if someone asks you um, to get a cup of coffee? Um, do it in a public place. That way, you know, you're not saying, um, you know, let's go to this place, you know, 10 blocks away, you know, let, let's go to the Starbucks down the, down, uh, downstairs. So um, find a way to make it comfortable for yourself. But I would hope that gender barriers in 2023 wouldn't be an issue um, as much as it used to be. In DC this week, we are, um, gossiping, critiquing, shocked, not shocked because everyone kind of knew about it, but all, all of a sudden it's in the media about a former FTC commissioner and prominent professor at George Mason who uh, did a lot of networking. And it turns out that his networking was very much tied to dates and, mm -hmm. and, and, and romance and, and pursuing, um, you know, uh, uh, women. And I think, you know, Emily's point, um, look, knowing too many men, if a woman in completely professional, you know, thinking wants to network. Um, some of these men, because someone has asked for contact information or said, Hey, I would like, can I have coffee with you? They think, well, she likes me. She must be interested in me because that's where those male Godzilla, you know, gorilla mm. brains go. And I think most of us realize there's no place for that, but it exists. And so, you know, how do how do we make sure that, you know, those men understand 
that this is a professional yeah. conversation. I, I guess it, yeah. it's that it's a, uh, you know, a meeting in, in, per, in, in person, uh, in, um, uh, you know, in a public uh, place that, that it's not a, you know, maybe it's not drinks uh, or yeah, during work hours, coffee sounds much more innocuous than saying, would you like to meet for drinks at eight o'clock at night? Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. but I, I do think, um, she, she really raises an yeah. important point of, uh, of caution and, uh, uh, welcome hearing for others who have sort of a, the proper way to, to, to send the message to those who jump to conclusions. Cause th that's where they want those. Conclusions that's right. To, that's to jump. Right. Yeah. That this is, uh, yeah. You, you better have your grown up hat on here. Um, that's so right. Here. Yes. Yes. Here. That's a good question. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. And can I offer a couple of tips for uh, the dreaded large group setting? <laughs> so uh, Jules, you know, you are an extrovert. You're a master at this. I see you walk into a room and you light up the room and uh, you draw energy from that. But for a lot of introverts, it is just exhausting and we avoid those. But conference season is coming up. There's um, IAPP conferences and, uh, and other things that are going to be in the fall and the spring. So I do have a couple of tips that uh, I would like to share on how to make these a little bit better. Um, the first thing that I do for myself is I give myself a minimum time that I have to be there. So in my early years, I used to walk in and then walk right back out because I would walk into this room and I would feel like everyone's already matched up already. Everybody's already having the time of their life when they're not, but that was my impression. So I say, I have to stay here for 20 minutes, 30 minutes. And if I'm completely miserable, then I could leave. But usually by giving myself a time limit, that helps. Also, if I get overwhelmed, I go to the side of the room. So I'm giving you all my secrets now. I go to the side of the room and pretend like I have an important text to respond to. Uh, so now you're going to see me at the side. You're going to say, she's, she's not responding to anything. But it just gives me a chance to catch my breath, survey the room, see who I want to go talk to next. But again, I don't let myself leave the room. Um, I also look for a line. I'm probably the only person in the world that looks for a drink line or a food line because it's easy to strike up a conversation with someone behind you. Now, don't do the person in front of you. Learn from my mistakes, because if you do the person in front of you, they get their drink, they're out of there. But if you turn to the person behind you, oh, what did you think of that speaker? What brought you here today? And then you have a nice conversation. You get your drink. You can stand and wait for them and continue the conversation. Um, and then one more tip is I look for people sitting. It's so, so much easier for me to go up to a table and say, uh, is this chair taken or can I join you? Then go up to people standing up and say, can I join you? I know that's so silly because it's just posture, but it's easier for me to find people sitting. So those are a couple of tips during conference season that that might help you all. You know, what got me comfortable um, early on, uh, I was uh, in local elected office and I had, I didn't have a big budget to, to kind of send out flyers and campaign. I, I had to approach people on the street, at subway stations, I had to knock on their doors. And it wasn't super comfortable at the beginning, but you know what happens? Most people, most people are actually fairly nice. And, um, you know, if they're in a rush, this and that, but most people, if you walk up and you just say, Hey, can I, you know, chat with you for a minute about this? Most people are actually happy to connect with another human being. Um, That's exactly and, right. and I think at conferences, the biggest complaint I have uh, from people is, oh, I go to these big conferences and I didn't meet anybody. It was all so anonymous. And oh, I had one good dinner and that was great. And I, I, you know, I really went there because the best thing was like I had drinks with these friends here, so on and so forth. And like everyone else actually wants to connect and they're all sad that they're not connecting and meeting. And so the reality is the number of times you will get shot down by approaching somebody in a reasonably friendly way and saying, you know, and they're wearing name tags, right? It's like, yes. hi, oh, you're at so-and-so. I want to, can I say hi? I'm so-and-so. People actually want to connect. And you know, it is rare that you will get a kind of like snobby sort of sneer away. Um, so, and it, you you're know You're exactly happens, right. You're exactly right. You're time out of 10, you know what? Kind of, you know, that's okay, right? So. You, no, you're, you're exactly right. And so I have, um, I have asked this question to thousands of people. I say, who likes these kind of events? And usually it's about 10 to 20% of the people that like the big ballroom events. That means that 80 to 90% of the people are thinking, don't let this be a waste of time. Please let somebody come up and talk to me, right? And so it changed my whole paradigm when I thought about it that way, that everybody knows these are important, but they don't know how to make the most of them. Um, you also mentioned about the name tags. I am famous for taking pictures of people's name tags that I will say, I'm terrible at remembering names. Can I just snap a picture of your name tag so I could find you later? 
And you know how it's usually met with? They usually say, oh, me too. Let me take a picture of yours. So you don't have to have any secrets for remembering people na people's names. Just take a picture and then you can find them later. And, you know, I have built my network one person at a time, not one ballroom at a time. So when people say, oh, that was a waste of time. I didn't meet anybody. I meet someone every single time because that's my goal. I tell myself I can't leave until I have one meaningful contact. I might have to talk to 10 people to find that one person, but that's how I built my network. Awesome. Well, as a regular speaker, I'll tell you this. Um, th there's nothing worse than a panel concluding and uh, the moderator saying, well, are there any questions? And nobody raises their hand. You know what? You're not the pushy show off if you raise your hand. You're raising a question that half the other people in the audience probably have. That's um, right. And you know what? One of the other reasons why I do it, if I'm not the speaker and I'm in the audience, I, I would like people to know I'm there. So I'm going to I'm going to raise if I have a question. Yeah, then I'm going to raise it. And it's probably something others are thinking. And then maybe they'll come over and agree or disagree and so on and so forth. OK, people go back to work. Um, uh, but do carve out some time in your day to tend to those uh, relationships. Uh, one last tip, you know, um, sometimes uh, I'll talk to somebody and they say, oh, I'm really happy. I'm not looking for a job. And I say the best time to be looking for a job is when you're really happy and you're not looking for a job. Because when you're looking for a job, now you're knocking on doors and you're asking people for, for favors and for stuff. And if you have an opportunity and they make an offer and it's not good enough, but like you need your job, you're not in the strongest position to say, I won't take that unless you pay me a lot more. When you're good, when it's fine, that's when you're looking for a job. But that doesn't mean sending out resumes. It means being someone in who's building their network, who's finding, right. making sure they are a findable person that other people think of them when an opportunity comes up because they met you. They are aware, you know, of you. Half the time, it's not skills. The skills matter. I'm assuming you got the skills. A lot of people got the skills. But are you someone who is on top of mind because you said hello to them, because you sent them a note? You need to be in the game to win the game. Um, it's not just blind luck. It's being in the game by showing up and and making sure that you know you're taking the time and day and, it, and it's as easy rachel tells us as just saying a kind word the kind of thing we all kind of ought to be doing we just we just get too busy or we just get you know we don't think about it anyway please relationships at work coming out on tuesday available already for sale um lots of practical tips whether you're an extrovert like me who really wants to body surf the crowd uh, or where you're someone who feels that this is work Rachel gives a lot of the tips um, that are practical and that I think are useful for everybody. Uh, and your uh, your your book um, purchase goes to charitable support. So sure Rachel, does. thanks so much. Um, connect with her on LinkedIn. Um, Find me on LinkedIn, Rachel B. Simon. Yes, I would love I would love to hear from all of you. And um, hopefully, I'll see you on the conference circuit. I'll be the one, you know, hugging the back wall. So come up and talk to me if I don't come up and talk to you. But yeah, look, looking forward to uh, connecting with you all. Thanks so much Great. for having me, Jules. Have a good weekend, everybody. Bye-bye. Right.